me tell you, let me tell you, if you're, this is your church, and you were there in this conference, and yesterday you were just a normal, everyday you, you missed something. I, I mean, hello, somebody. Let me tell you, you missed something. You, because God was there. God, oh my goodness, I can't even begin to, to describe or explain. I mean, that's how many, I know, I know our church took care of, of the, of the children's ministry on Thursday. But let me tell you, if you did not hear that message, you need to get that message. If you can't get that message, you come to me because I stood there and I recorded every bit of it. Because I was at the edge of my seat. I'm not the type of guy that cries. How many know that about me? I'm not the type of guy that cries. Amen. My grandchildren were born. It was amazing to me. I was at all, but I wasn't crying. That, that service from beginning to end, I was crying. And I was ticked off at myself. Because I in the midst of the in the middle of the whole entire sermon, I asked myself, why am I crying? I don't even know why I'm crying. It's like, do I feel convicted? What's going on? Why am I crying? And you know what I realized? The presence of God was there in such a way. Oh my goodness. I mean, it was it was a tremendous just a tremendous time, and, and, and for those that don't know, uh, I didn't get to preach last week. So, I put a sermon together on momentous, amen. I said, well, Pastor Roman might not have put me down on the list, I'm putting myself down on the list. And our, and our conference just got extended to Sunday, amen. <laughs> so, so if, you didn't, if you didn't go to the conference, amen, uh, now you can say you win, amen. Praise the Lord, we're bringing the conference right to you. But let me tell you, it was an awesome time. I titled this message, After a Momentous Conference. Let me tell you, it was, it was, it was life-changing. It was, it, it, it you know, I, I, I told folks, man, that Thursday, I almost felt like I was lukewarm in my walk with God. And that Thursday night, I rededicated my life to God. Amen. And it, it, it was, it was, it's, you know, it, I don't know if this morning you guys notice our, the, in the, just in the worship, I mean, there's, there's something, there's something, the presence of God is, is stirring our hearts. Uh, most of you guys don't know this, but listen, our church is getting ready to, to go through a momentous experience, a momentous time in our congregation. For this, those that don't know, you know, as, as a leadership, we, we get together and we have meetings uh, once a week and we kind of, I try, it's my time to kind of minister to them. I, I'm, I'm not sure of the time, but about a year ago, I want to say, we were at a leaders meeting and, and Brother Joe, you gave a word. He gave a word. And listen, that word, we're living it out right now. That word, we're living it out right now. It's taking place. It's taking place right now. Brother Joe talked about how there was going to be a big group of people. And you got to realize this was before the, the movement ever had their own service on a Friday. This was be, way before many of you guys even were coming to the church. Way before that. He had no idea what was taking place. It's not like we, you know, put this idea in this. This is, this is not man-made or man-built. But your word was literally, there was going to be a big group of young folks that were going to come into the church. Listen, a big group of young folks that were going to come into the church. When he said that, I'm going to be honest with you guys, I was focused on the youth. In our past history, we had a great move of a revival within the youth. And I was, man, okay, that, well, he's talking about the youth. But we did not understand this. We didn't know what was going to take place within the young adults. We didn't understand how there was going to be just a group of young adults that were going to come and get saved. And he was talking about how, how all these new folks that were coming into the church were inside the church. And they're hungry and they're desiring God. And then he also talked about this. Listen, this is where some of us have been in church for a while. We got to catch this and we got to hear this. There's a group of older folks. And I, what, I, what I took from that, it doesn't mean that you're older. It means that you're older in your walk with God. And that older group of people are outside the church. They're outside because they're just religious. They haven't caught it. They don't understand it. And there's this group of people within the church that are hungry, that want more of God. And I believe this morning that we're experiencing, amen, that time, that momentous moment right now. And I listen, mark it down on your calendar. 
Because I assure you that what's taking place right now, we will begin to see the effects of this a year, two, three, four, five years from now. Because God is on the move. I said he is on the move. I was thinking, man, what do I preach on after a conference like that? What do I preach on? I was like, man. So right early in the morning yesterday, I knew it was, it was going to be on momentous. Amen. And if you guys turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. For those that don't know, we're going to three services. Woo! We're having our uh, ministry fair outside uh, today. Listen, if you're not involved in any kind of ministry, you, you, you don't know how to get involved. We're, we're, we're bringing a table right to you. It's right outside. Right? We're bringing the table right to you, right outside. And there's, there's a lot of different areas that you can get involved. You can get involved in, in the greeters. Now, obviously, listen, the, the, the area that you involve yourself, you've you got to know that, hey, I can flow in this area. If you have a hard time uh, uh, greeting people, maybe you don't want to join the greeters. Yeah. Right? Because, I mean, that, 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 that ministry, you've got you to gotta be able to put yourself out there. You've got to be able to smile. You've got you, you to gotta be able to be presentable. Right? So and we have the kitchen. We want, we want folks to come into the kitchen, and that's an awesome ministry because uh, you get to meet everybody. I mean, for God's sake, we get free coffee, so everybody gets coffee, right? It's free. You'd be crazy not to get the coffee. Not only is it free, but it's the best coffee in town. <laughs> Amen? So you get to see everybody in church. You get to meet everybody, and there's also the, the, the ushers. And how many know, I mean, the ushers are backed in the back, and they work hard. They, uh, we got a guy. Do you guys realize throughout the whole entire service, we got a, one guy outside Watching your car. They're watching your car. See what's in there. Good to steal. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> We're watching your car. Make sure that nobody breaks into the car, believe it or not. In the bass, uh, somebody's truck got broken into back there in the back. And, and while we were having service, so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. We have the ushers. They make sure that, that we're seated. They make sure if anybody tries to get cray-cray, they'll take care of them. Amen. That's why we... You, you know, you got. If you're gonna be an usher, we don't want you to be a twig or small. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got. I'm just messing around, just playing around. We could use you. Hallelujah. Amen. But uh, there, we got the usher ministry. Amen. We have we have children's church. Oh, come on, let's give a hand for children's church. You know why? That's the next generation. I said that's the next generation. The, that's that's the next youth right there. I said that's the next youth. I remember how many were you did you did you guys hear Michael Hernandez and his wife being sent out? Isn't that amazing? I remember Michael Hernandez when he used to come over to my house and just get me ticked off because he was just a he's just a kid, man. Listen, those kids out there, those that's the future men and women that are gonna be getting sent out of out of this church. Amen. We gotta listen, so that's not just oh, I'm just gonna go over there and babysit kids. No. You're going to go out there next door if that's, if that's your calling and pour into those children. Come on now. Come on. God's taking us to another level. We got to go to another level in our understanding of what ministry is really all about. So I encourage you guys to, to go out there and sign up for all the different ministries. Worship. Amen. We, listen, if, now you can sign, we, now you got to be a little bit mature for worship because you got to be able to try out. And if you, uh, if you don't. If you don't make it, you got to be able to say, be able to take the fact that we're going to tell you, uh, don't call us, we'll call you, kind of, <laughs> all right? Obviously, worship is not for every. I've been trying to be on the worship team since I got here at church. And my God, I'm like my wife and, and, and Pastor Matt and some of the people that are in charge. It's like, come on, I'm the pastor. Take me, right? You got to hear me. I sing better in the bathroom, the echo and all that. I got to bring the bathroom out here so I can try out. But there's just, there's just so much the sound guys back there in the back. Let's give them, uh, let me tell you. I realized, man, I don't know if you guys were there at the conference. And, man, I'm getting so out of my notes. But you know what was awesome? You know what was so awesome to me? I don't know if you guys were there and you guys watched all this take place. But our church was engaged in our conference. Everywhere I looked at. There's somebody from our church in that ministry just engaged and, and all week long. I mean, Pastor Matt, he was there on Monday, Monday morning to like, you didn't even go to the pastor's dinner. I'm like, man, he missed the pastor's dinner. Oh, well, give me his plate. Amen. <laughs> I'll eat it. Amen. But he was there Tuesday early in the morning all the way right before a conference actually started, making sure that all that, I mean, and everybody this, that participated. You know what was so awesome? Watching all our, our photographers taking pictures of that conference, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to kid on these pictures. That's for sure. 
Amen. <laughs> I was like, praise the Lord, but it's awesome to see what God is doing. But you know, that was, as I was thinking about this sermon and having a momentous moment, I was like, Lord, where do you want me to go? A, a, a passage of scripture that, or a story that was just, just transformed, that just, that just changed history, that just changed. And, 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 he, and he took me to the book of Acts, Pentecost. Now, how many know that was a momentous moment, man? If you guys have your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And as I read this, these passages, I want you to kind of envision, you know, we, we read this and we, we focus on the, uh, uh, of, of, of the Holy Spirit coming down, the power, and I understand that. But as I began to read this, I kind of thought about it as, as throughout our week, our week of conference. And this, just, 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 when the day of Pentecost came, and the conference finally came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Our fellowship was gathered together in one place. Suddenly, there was a noise from the sky, which sounded like a strong wind blowing. How many of you heard that noise? I said, how many of you heard that noise? I heard that noise. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. Did you get touched last week? I mean, did you get touched? I'm not talking about that somebody touched you because they wanted to get by in your row. I'm not talking about somebody touching you because you're falling asleep. I'm asking you, did you truly get touched? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, religious people who had came from every country in the world. They came from every country, all of our fellowship, from wherever they're from. We all came together. We all gathered. When they heard this noise, a large crowd gathered. They were all excited because all of them heard the believers talking in their own language. Can I ask you something? When the preaching went forth, did you hear it in your language? I'm not talking about English. But we all speak a certain language. There are only certain words that challenge you. Certain words or cer certain ways that challenge me that, that might not nece necessarily challenge you. Did you hear it in your own language? Amazed and confused, they kept asking each other, what does this mean? But others made fun of the believers saying these people are crazy. I pray that you're not part of that crowd. These guys are drunk. They don't know what they're doing. What's going on? Three services, they're insane. Crazy. Madness. Conference all week long? It's insane. I got things to do. They're drunk. They're crazy. They're not thinking straight. This is, as I started thinking about having a momentous moment, this stood out to me. This story. Now, we know what took place. Peter stood up. Same Peter that denied Jesus. Denied him three times. He preaches, and 3,000 get saved. What would take place if you accept the challenge of the Holy Spirit. And as you accept, you allow him to equip you and thrust you into your purpose and your destiny. And in boldness, you just begin to speak. Begin to speak the truths of God. Not only over your life, but on, over the lives of others. The Bible says that over 3,000 got saved. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we come before you. In Jesus' name.
This morning, we just pray your presence. We pray your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would challenge and encourage us. We pray that you would have your way in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Now, I believe that everybody here, everybody here, we all have momentous moments in our life. We all have a graduation, a marriage, a promotion, or the birth of a child. These events and others like them have a, have a very big significant impact in the direction of our lives. And not just our individual lives, but in the lives of others. We all have these momentous experiences that take place that change the course of our lives. My question this morning is, last week during this conference, was it just another conference? Was it just some good preaching? Was it just some good worship? Was it just another year? We just got together and we send out some more churches. Or is it truly a momentous moment in your life? Because, listen, if it was just an ordinary moment, then you're just going to go on life the way you went into this conference. You know, yesterday, I couldn't stop. Yesterday, the whole entire day from beginning to end, I couldn't stop just taking inventory. And just trying to figure these things out. Because after that conference, God, ch listen, God challenged me. God challenged me. Anybody ever challenge you? You guys remember being kids? I remember my mom one time challenged me. You know how my mom challenged me? She kicked me out of the house. <laughs> I would never be the same ever again. That was a challenge. Did God challenge you such a way that you know I can't be the same no more? I said, I can't be the same no more. I can't be the same no more. Or did you just wake up Saturday and just the routine as normal? I'm talking about a momentous moment. We all go through them. Every single one of us, we all go through them. It, either, either you have a, 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 a birth or what have you. For instance, Jessica, you, just, you guys just had a baby. Share how that was a momentous moment. Praise God. I mean, you know, when you have a baby, when you have a baby, that's a momentous moment. <laughs> Can you imagine a couple, no baby, they go to a restaurant, what do you do when you get out of the car? You get out of the car and you're going right into the restaurant. Praise God. Hallelujah. You sit down. Now you have a baby and you both get out of the car and you're looking at each other. You mean the baby doesn't get out of the car by itself? She says something. Now I got to think. Now I just can't pray for my husband and I. Now I got to pray for somebody else. So now either your prayer life just got extended. Or you try to juggle three within that 15, 20 minute span. Everything changes. I said everything changes. Has, has any of you, before you have a baby, go by the baby section. Look at how much diapers cost. <laughs> everything changes. Groceries used to be 50, 60, 80, 100 bucks. Now they're 200. And you only added one more member. <laughs> right? Everything changes. If it was a momentous moment, this conference, things have to change. I said things have to change. We all experience them. We all experience them. You just got married. How was that a momentous moment? <laughs> I cheat. Uh, no, but uh, for me, it was more of uh, I was always at church, and then I knew there was a new church that was starting on the fall or the spring or whatever it was. And now all of a sudden, it's like, hey, do you want to come down? Or, hey, uh, you know, I got a group of strangers that I've never met before. Do you want to come down? Or blah, blah, blah. But other than that, it, it, it's now, it, I don't only care about myself. I don't care about my wife. 
Amen. That's a momentous moment. Getting married. He talked about something vital. You're single. You do whatever you want. Right? If your parents say, you know, don't do this, you're like, whatever. <laughs> you can't whatever your husband. You can't whatever your wife. Mm-hmm. Because then later on, it'd be whatever. <laughs> little, little, little are there. Right? Momentous moment. These moments in our lives, they made a decision to get married, and it changed. It changes the rest of their life. I said it changes the rest of their life. They can't continue to go on the way it was before. There is no way that you can go on the way it was before. As a matter of fact, if you try to go about life the way, is bore, the way it was before, you're going to confront a lot of struggles and a lot of issues. Come on now. Momentous moments. Brother Jerry, you just had a heart attack. Why don't you come up here? He just had a heart attack. Momentous moments. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So I was thinking about these, these testimonies, the momentous moments. So a lot of us, we're thinking, okay, we had a momentous moment last week. So why is it that some of us continue to live life just the way it's always been? See, these times in their life, they woke up and the baby's there. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't just feelings. It wasn't just a thought. It wasn't just goosebumps. It was a reality. And the baby's there. They're forced. They're literally forced. A lot of times, you don't want to take care of that baby. I mean, we love the baby. Don't think, oh my God, we're coming to church. Just take care of the baby. But <laughs> I, went, I went to San Francisco when my daughter had her baby. And we were there for a whole week. That baby woke up every two hours. They had a small, in San Francisco, it's so expensive. They had a really small place. We were all sleeping like in the same room. I was like, can't you just bring her to the house? I love my granddaughter, but like, can we like put her on a schedule? Like, hey, <laughs> eight at night, eight in the morning, maybe? <laughs> it was real. It was inconvenient. It was inconvenient. It was painful. It forced change. It forced change. See, we had this momentous moment. But we're not forcing any change. We woke up Saturday and it become a reality. We made commitments, but those commitments don't become a reality. They're just there. It needs to be. It needs to become a reality. If you get married... You wake up next morning. Oh, she's here still. (laughs) 
good Lord, he's still here. <laughs> Remember getting married and having to go to the restroom? Like, when is she going to go? Because, you know, you go to the restroom, you don't want to fart and all that. You just got married. <laughs> None of you guys ever experienced that? Yeah, after you're married 20 years, it doesn't matter, right? But it's a reality. We're married. It's a, it becomes a reality. And if that reality forces change, it forces change. It forces change. I'm thinking about having a heart attack. I mean, I didn't have the heart attack, but I'm there. Went to the hospital to see Jerry, and because I'm older, I'm thinking, wow, this is a reality in my life. I can imagine what he's going through. I'm thinking to myself, watching him, like, I, I, we, we, we came to church after we visited him, and we, I'm, I'm telling my wife, God, i got to change the way I eat. i got to start doing some exercises. i got to sign myself up to a gym or do something because it becomes a reality. Momentous moments. You see... What are some of the things that we can learn through this passage that took place in the disciples' life that, that caused that experience to be momentous? First thing is they allowed it to affect their mind. Not just at the moment. See, I believe that you were at the conference last week. It affected your mind to a certain degree. But I'm talking about it affecting your mind in such a way that you're forced to make changes. You're forced to make changes that you don't necessarily want. You're forced to quit your job because it's not the job that God wants you to have. You're forced to cut relationships. And I just ain't talking to the single people. I'm talking about you having friends that are not saved. Friends that don't encourage you to serve God. We all have them. I said we all have them. Oh, hallelujah. You're, did you feel that? Did you feel that? Affecting your mind in such a way that you wake up next morning and there's a baby crying. You wake up the next morning. And there's somebody sleeping right next to you. And oh my gosh, I have to make changes. I just had a heart attack. I want to eat that burrito. But I know I got to say no to that because I have to make changes. I have to make changes. It affected their minds. Prior to being filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, they were carnal. Carnal-minded. Oh, hallelujah. Everything leading to that. They were carnal-minded. Peter denied the Lord three times. Why? Because he was carnal-minded. The disciples, they all deserted Jesus. Why? Because they were carnal-minded. Why is it that you and I don't engage the way God wants us to engage? Because we're carnal-minded. We focus more on my time. You know, Pastor Omar used to always joke with me about something, but throughout this week, it became so real, and it was so joking. I used to be very involved in Paramount. I used to be there all the time, literally all the time. And sometimes I used to complain to Pastor Omar, and he'd be like, man, I'm here all the time, Pastor. I never even get to heaven. And Pastor Omar would look at me, he said, you rest when you get to heaven. And you know, to a certain degree, I hate to say this, but that's so true. I, let me tell you, <laughs> there is so much truth to that that we don't understand. They were, up to this point, they were carnal-minded. But once they were filled by the Holy Spirit, whoo! once they were filled by the Holy Spirit, 
They were no longer carnal minded. Now they were spiritual minded. Here's a man who denied Jesus three times. Here's a man who when he's confronted, hey, aren't you one of them? He denies to even know who Jesus is. He begins to change the way he speaks. And now he stands before the crowd and he begins to preach the truth of Jesus Christ. Here's men and women who desert Jesus because they're afraid. They're thinking about themselves. They're thinking about taking care of their own issues, their own job, their own home, their own protection. Well, how does, how does ministry benefit me? Where's my alone time? Where's my time with my husband? Where's my time with my wife? Oh, come on now. This is some good preaching. <laughs> carnally minded. Carnally minded. We're talking about heaven here, folks. I said, we're talking about heaven, folks. We're talking about heaven. Prior to Pentecost, they were driven by their self-centeredness, their desire for their own purpose and will in life. Jesus, who's going to sit on the right-hand side of you? Let it be me. Jesus, we've left everything behind. What are we going to get? <laughs> so this, this, prior to this, 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 this was their concern. They were carnal minded. Going into this conference. Going through the conference. Through the preaching. Did you hear the deliverance of the word of God in your life in your own language? Did you hear it? Did you, did you hear God pinpoint the areas of our life, the area of your life where you are carnally minded? Did you? Because if you didn't, you're not going to have a momentous win. It has to affect in life, we have to go from being carnal to being spiritual minded. From being carnal to being spiritual minded. Our flesh has a way of telling us and reminding us that we're carnally minded. Your, your stomach ever begins to growl? You feed the flesh. Does your spiritual stomach ever growl? I don't starve myself. Let me, let me, the only time I don't eat is when I, when I fast. But I don't starve myself. But even though I don't starve myself, my stomach reminds me that you're hungry. Yesterday we got up and we ate. I can't remember what we ate throughout the day. And I was busy and I was doing all kinds of stuff there at the house. And around 8 o'clock, something happened. Hmm. I went on my phone. I looked at pizza. <laughs> A vegetable pizza. <laughs> Thin crust. I tried. They didn't have it. So I tried. spiritual minded did your spiritual stomach growl at all all day yesterday it didn't do because you're not spiritual minded our mind needs to be affected second it affected their hearts in Acts chapter 15 verse 8 and 9 it says, when Peter talked ab about the Gentiles being filled with the, with the Spirit, he declared that their hearts were purified by faith. In Acts chapter 15, verse 8 and 9, it says, So God, who knows the heart, 
acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. One of the manifestations that came along with being filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the sound of this mighty rushing wind. How many know here, we, how, many, how many realize we live in Los Angeles? You ever close to the mountains and look into the LA area and you get, to, you get the awesome privilege of seeing the smog hover over LA? Anybody ever seen that? Anybody? You ever blown away like, I live under, right underneath that. <laughs> like, is that what I'm breathing? Most of you guys don't remember this, but when I was in school, I, literally in school they would have these alarms. And when the alarm would go off, I had to, we all students had to go in class because the smog was just too bad. You, you might not want to raise your hand because you're revealing your age, but some of you guys remember that. They don't have that nowadays. But it's amazing. You go up to the mountains or you're, you're at a sky rise building and you see over LA, you're like, what the heck? You know what the wind does to that though? It blows. drives away the smog. It drives away the pollution that lies within our hearts. Too often. I mean, you know, in the routine of life, in the routine of serving God in and out, the routine of marriage, how many of you are married? The routine of family, how many of you are part of a family? I think that's all of us to a certain degree. Either you have a brother, you have a sister, you have a mom, you have a dad. You know, dads complain about kids. Your kids are complaining about dads, right? I can't believe my daughter. I can't believe my son. I can't, be son is, I can't believe my dad. I can't believe my mom. We all doing it. We just all see it from different angles. Some of us, we got jobs. You have a good boss, a bad boss. You have a good co-worker, a bad co-worker. Drama taking place. Through the routine of life, you come to church. And this happens in church. That happens in church. And it has a way of building smog around our hearts. And we're breathing all this toxic. And we start seeing things. The things of God. Cloudy. Start seeing it just cloudy. Can I ask you something? Did this cause them to affect your hearts? Did you hear the sound of the rushing wind where it just came and just blew all that toxic away? And you're like, my goodness, I can't believe. I can't believe I allowed myself to see it that way. To act that way. Did it affect your heart? Oh, man. See, church, we desperately need a refreshing. We need God to breathe on us. We need the smog, that smog, that gunk that's over our heart. We need the presence of God to just breathe that away. All those things that, we, the, that keep us away from his will, from his purpose. Our first love. How many remember your first love? Oh, come on, somebody. Get excited with me. How many remember your first love? I remember when I first fell in love with my wife. Mmm. Ciao. That was good. You remember, Beth? Remember how in love you were with me? <laughs> I lit up her world. Every once in 
once in a while, me and her, we go through stuff. We've gone through things in our life where we stopped talking to each other for a couple of days. We go to bed and I get on my side and I'm like right on the edge. She goes on her side and she goes on her edge. Sometimes we even put pillows right in between us. We pretend like this to hold our back, but we know what they're for. <laughs> Sometimes we get mad at each other and we say things that we really don't mean. Which we have to be careful what we say because words do hurt. once in a while we just need a little bit of pressure in our life makes me feel like a kid again and reminds me of my first love letter I would because you gotta realize though this is before cell phones <laughs> this is when you literally had to go to a pay phone and I used to there's a, there's a liquor store right there on, on Rosecrans by Valley View there's a there's look, 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 liquor store there used to be a pay phone outside I don't know if it's still there she lived right down the street from there I would get on that pay phone and I would talk to her and be out there on the phone for about an hour, an hour and a half. It wasn't like today. Now if you're on a phone an hour and a half, you're in your bedroom on your cell phone. I literally had to be outside <laughs> in a phone booth. Do you remember your first love with Jesus? Do you remember that? I mean, come on. Remember that first time you accepted the Lord? Remember when you got those cigarettes that when you got that pot, how many of you went to that girl and she was fine? You said, it's over because I'm serving God. Remember that? Remember when you went up to that guy and he was good, he was hot? But you said, it's over because I'm serving God. Remember that? Remember that when you took that stand in your relationship because you guys were having sex before you got married and you got, you got your first love and you got saved and you went up to her or you went up to him and said, I ain't doing this no more. I ain't having sex with you no more because God touched my life. Do you remember that? Oh, hallelujah. Some of you guys don't remember because you guys ain't clapping. Do you remember that? Do you remember when you deleted your Facebook? Some of us, we need to delete our Facebook. Some of us, we need to delete our Instagram. I didn't hear none of you young guys say amen. Come on now. It's not helping you. Do you remember your first love with Jesus? Do you remember your first love? Oh, hallelujah. Man, Pastor Mike, I don't want you to go to any more conferences. <laughs> Do you remember? Or is it all fogged up right now? You really can't see clear through it. Lastly, it affected her speech. I'm going to go through this really quick. Peter denies the Lord, his speech. He denies the Lord three times. The day of Pentecost, he stands up. He's not afraid. He's not the center of life anymore. It affects his speech. He says, you know what he does? He begins to speak the truths of God. You want to have a momentous moment? It has to affect your speech. When you speak, are you speaking the truth of God? Negativity is not the truth of God. As a matter of fact, can I tell you something? When you get around a negative people, get the heck away from them. Because that stuff is like a rotten apple. It's contagious. I can tell. Listen, 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 listen. I can tell who is hanging around with who. I can tell. If they're excited about going to three services, I can tell. You, you must be hanging around with the young adults or something like that. Young adults are like, Pastor, four, three? Let's go four. I, I got, we got to use a little wisdom. A little. 
a little. And then you also hear those people like, well, what do you think? What do you, are you going to come to these services? I'm not. You don't think it leaks out? You don't think it leaks out, your negativity? You don't think it affects people? You don't think it affects their passion and what God is trying to do in their hearts? If you want to be negative about something, you and God begin to deal with it. You and God begin to deal with it. Don't be like a rotten apple and rotten somebody else. When I'm negative about something, I don't go around and, well, Pastor Nick, man, what do you think about Pastor Omar? He wants, me, he wants us to go to another meeting. I don't want to go to another meeting. Do you want to go to another meeting? <laughs> we already have enough meetings as it is, isn't it? Don't we? <laughs> Let me tell you, I have, I have thoughts like that. I'm human just like you are. I deal that with that between me and God. God, you need to help me. I'm dealing with issues. I don't know if I'm right in my thinking. I don't know if I'm struggling. I don't know if I can, it's kind of cloudy for me right now and I can't truly see. But what I'm not going to do is I'm going to rotten somebody else. What I want to do is like Peter, stand up. Can you imagine if Peter would have turned around and said, hey, you guys, what do you guys think? Should I preach? As I preach, man, we might get stoned. We might get killed. What do you guys think? There's a lot of people out here. There's more of them than there is of us. What do you think? Oh, come on now. Come on now. It's got to affect your speech. It's got to affect your speech. When you're at home, it's got to affect your speech. Honey, we can do this. But honey, we fight a lot. We can make it. I said we can make it. We can make it. It's got to affect your speech. Don't talk negative about your kids. They are going to serve God. They are going to serve God. I know what I see. I know what's before. I know what's taking place, but I know the Bible promises me that my whole household will be saved. And I will speak it all the way through. I will speak it all the way through. I know I'm struggling with this, but listen, I'm going to have victory. I'm going to have victory. I'm going to overcome this struggle. It has to affect your speech. I said it has to affect your speech. Don't come to church. Well, you know what? Poor is me. Woe is me. I'll never do nothing for God. Listen, it's got to affect your speech. It's got to affect your speech. You know what? I might not have a high school diploma. I might not have gone to college. I might not even understand the Bible. But I know God spoke into my life last week. And God's going to use me. I don't know to what degree he's going to use me, but tell, let me tell you, God is going to use me. God is going to use me. Let it affect your speech. Let it affect your speech. Let it affect your speech. Don't be negative. I said, don't be negative. We serve a big God. We serve a big God. I just realized last week, man, how big our God is. tell you guys something that happened to me yesterday my wife actually in the midst of everything that's taking place in my life my wife made it took a video of pastor William and she tagged him on it and so moments later she got a message from pastor William started asking questions my wife started answering the questions, told, her, told him who we were. And he responds back, God just spoke to me. You're among the five people that we, I got to bless today. I'll be sending you $15,000. My wife started crying. I almost cried, man. <laughs> I was like, I did? Okay. I did. But I'm be honest with you, there was this side of me was like, wow. Wow. Fifteen thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. That ain't fifteen folks, that ain't fifteen dollars. <laughs> That's not even a thousand five hundred. Because a lot of you guys are thinking, did you say a thousand five? Fifteen thousand. Can I be honest with you? I got excited. 
My wife got excited. You ready for this? This is a lie. It wasn't Pastor William. Somebody made a bogus account of Pastor William. And God spoke to me. And he said, when you thought man was going to bless you, bless the soul of Jeff. You demonstrated a momentous spirit. Can you trust me that way? This is my personal experience. Jeff, can you trust me? Can you get momentously excited about what I want to do in your life? Been, I've been getting hit from every side in the last few weeks. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You know, last week, I'm gonna, my wife didn't want me to tell nobody, but I'm going to tell them. <laughs> God challenged me to tell them. To quit my job and go full time. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. Don't, don't, don't. You know how much I've been wanting that? And when I was there, at the verge, you know how afraid I was? God showed me later on that this challenge wasn't so much for me to go full time, but he just wanted to see where I was at in my faith in him. My wife was ready to go, to my, go home and, and, and type out my, my resignation letter. And I said, no, I was so scared. I couldn't trust God. I couldn't trust God. I was there, and God was challenging me. God was, come on, just say yes. And I made every single excuse. And by Friday, I was like, okay, Lord, whatever you want. And it was like, no, I'm not being challenged to go full time. I need you to show me where you truly are in your relationship with me. That's all it was. These were momentous moments in my life. I can never be the same old man. I can never be the same again. I can never be the same again. I can never be the same again. If I can just have every head bow and every eye closed this morning.